Okay, welcome back everyone. So just so I have a sense of this, uh, how many people are still working on their R and bioconductor environment? Anybody? Just one? Okay, that's, that's great. Anybody else having problems? Okay, very good. Okay, so this afternoon we're going to talk about um, clustering, classification, and feature selection. So we'll give you an introduction to clustering, and that really involves uh, distance metrics, uh, and then two types of algorithms, hierarchical clustering and partitioning-based clustering. And I'm going to give you uh, an example of classification. Uh, the major concepts involved in building a classifier, uh, hopefully avoiding overfitting, and, uh, and a little bit about cross-validation. And then throughout, we're going to talk about um, the concept of feature selection and how that helps in clustering and classification. So clustering uh, is also called unsupervised learning. Uh, and it really involves the discovery of patterns in data. So this is, this is when you have a data set and uh, you don't know ahead of time um, what, sub, what structure there might be in this data set. And, uh, and so we often cluster data in order to do what we call class discovery. So there may be, for example, you take your whole gene expression data set and you cluster it and lo and behold some some patients exhibit a certain profile, and other patients exhibit a different profile. And, uh, and so uh, we can consider this as grouping together objects that are most similar, or conversely, you can think of it as being least uh, dissimilar. So and these objects in the data, they can be genes, or they can be patients, or samples, uh, or both. Okay? So again, here's a question. Are there samples in my cohort of patients that can be subgrouped based on molecular profiling? And the real um, end point of this is you might want to find subgroups, but at the end of the day, um, we all are here because we probably have some sort of clinical outcome data um, that we want to be able to associate these groups with. And, uh, and so that's the, the, the final step, is being able to associate subgroups with clinical outcome. So, I'm just going to go over now uh, distance metrics. So a key step, and you can't, a critical step, you can't do clustering without this. In order to perform clustering, we have to have a way to measure how similar or dissimilar uh, two objects are. And so the, uh, the classical distance function is, is a function called Euclidean distance. And here I've just shown, um, you can consider these as, for example, two patients. So a patient X and a patient Y. And um, each patient has uh, between uh, one and has, has P features. Okay, so these, are, these could be genes. Um, and what we're going to do is just measure the difference of each of the features, uh, square that value, and sum that up over all the positions. And then just take the square root of that value, and that's just called that's you called Euclidean distance. So um, that's so another term for features um, is are you can consider them as dimensions. So sometimes you see you hear about multi-dimensional Euclidean distance or uh, multivariate Euclidean distance, uh, and that's how you calculate it. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. There's another distance function called Manhattan distance, and this just takes the absolute value of the difference between uh, each feature, between two cases, uh, and sums up that quantity. And so you end up with this, this type of, uh, this formula here. So this, th these two formulas basically tell you exactly how to calculate these two uh, distances. And, and these distances are just now taken as standard metrics and are rolled into almost virtually every hierarchical or uh, any clustering based method. And you can just choose it, choose Euclidean or choose Manhattan. Um, or, or others as well. So uh, a third metric that um, actually has some nice advantages for gene expression is, is 1 minus the correlation. So um, when we look at two samples, we can take a, a Pearson correlation coefficient. So presumably 
people know what that is, where you, you can calculate the correlation coefficient, and that will be between uh, 1 and 0. And so then you take 1 minus that value. And, and pr in, this actually reduces. This is very nice. I mean, I didn't show the formula here because the correlation coefficient formula is kind of hairy. But um, basically, people understand what this is. But the nice thing about this is this is proportional um, to Euclidean distance. However, uh, it has a very nice property that it's invariant to uh, degrees of scale of measurements between the two um, between the two samples or the two two objects that um, they're looking at. So, so if one sample has a dynamic range um, that's higher than the other, but yet the relative um, ordering of the genes is, is, is similar, then the correlation should be quite high. Um, however, uh, uh, that this would be affected, um, the same thing would be affected if you were to just use Euclidean distance. And this is really the principal reason for why normalization of data is actually important. So you can um, try to make this um, dynamic range invariant across the samples and so that you can use um, other metrics that, like, such as Euclidean distance effectively. Okay, so um, so here just schematically I've just, I've just put down um, two samples that uh, here we have some genes that are um, that are upregulated. Here we have some genes that are downregulated. Uh, so you can see that these two would be dissimilar, uh, and these two samples would be quite similar. So, so yeah. are you calculating of the of the so yeah, so you can do it either way, right? So you can do it um, of each pair of genes, or you can do each pair of patients, yeah. and actually do both. Uh, I have a question. Okay, so here is a, a heat map representation of a distance, a distance matrix. And so what this matrix represents is um, for each of the patients, um, and, and it just says from, from this is proportion of patients, uh, but, but really each, each column here is a patient, and each row here is a patient. Um, I just calculated the Euclidean distance between each patient from our breast cancer um, gene expression data set that we'll work on in the lab. And, and then what I did is I clustered them and then, uh, and then plotted, so then sorted the patients based on, uh, on, a, on a clustering. And you can see that these basically, the, this set of patients here um, are quite close together from a distance perspective. Uh, and, and they're quite different from this, this block here. So really what you get out of the data, there might be some structure here as well. Um, but what you get out of this data is that um, they're more or less, from a Euclidean distance perspective, two big blocks. Right? Um, so everyone can hopefully see that. If you use Manhattan, um, you get a different type of structure. Um, and again, the data that's input to this is identical. The clustering algorithm is identical. The only thing I've changed is the distance metric. And so if you use a different distance, distance metric, you get a different result. Okay. Now it just so happens that this block here and this block here, if you put them together, would probably sum up to this block here. So it's just a finer level partition of the data. Um, and then finally, if you use Pearson, um, what's nice about Pearson is that actually the the distinguishing um, metric uh, is, has a greater dynamic range. So that it really can you can visualize this and you can really see that these ones are really highly similar. Um, and and and, uh, and and they're quite distinct from these ones. So um, at the end of the day, what I want you to take away from this is that the distance metric matters. The choice of distance metric um, really does affect the result. And so uh, one shouldn't just blindly um, employ a distance metric. Um, you should get to know your data uh, beforehand and uh, understand the properties of the data. And one of the things we're going to do in the lab, um, just the first plot you're going to do, is just to make sure, have an idea of what's the dynamic range of the expression values of each of the samples. And um, and gives you a gauge of how well normalized or how well com comparable uh, these these samples are. OK? Mm -hmm. So that's the, it's also the patients on the y-axis, too. Okay, so this, yeah, same patients, right? So it's the same ordering of the patients. So that's why there's the, on the diagonal you see that they're identical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, 
So I think that uh, really comes down to, to knowing your data. So um, it's important to do some exploratory data analysis ahead of time. And um, we don't have time to really cover the, that in this workshop. But um, if you have, uh, if you quantile normalize your data, for example, and you have the range, the dynamic range of all the data is relatively similar, um, then one can probably safely use um, Euclidean distance. If you still want to be robust to that, then one might use the Pearson correlation coefficient. Um, as a, as a distance, distance metric. So here's just another distance metric that you might encounter. And it just again, this is just to have um, the language um, that, you know, to give you the language that if you're going to talk to the person that um, is analyzing your data or, or you're analyzing yourself, <coughs> you can understand what these terms mean. So, so Hamming distance uh, is often used for ordinal or binary or categorical data. Essentially, what it does is it counts up the number of features that are different uh, between two samples. Okay. So uh, you may have reduced your gene expression data set to up, neutral, or down, for example. And then you can look at each feature between two samples and say, are they the same or are they different? And also, that binary categorical is continuous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so that, that more or less covers the, the distance metrics that I wanted to go over. Um, so now let's talk about approaches to clustering. There are really two main categories of clustering algorithms. One is uh, based on partitioning, and the other is based on hierarchical. Um, partitioning, you may have heard of uh, k-means. How many people have heard of k-means? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we have... Uh, uh, K-metoids, which is also um, called partitioning around metoids, and that's a, a, a closely related cousin to K-means, and I'll explain what the differences and similarities are. And then within these partitioning methods, you also have model-based approaches, and I'll touch briefly on, on model-based approaches, um, which are sort of more advanced from a statistical perspective. <clears throat> the hierarchical methods uh, basically involve building nested clusters. Uh, where you essentially you start with pairs and then you build up a tree um, to the root, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. So let's talk about partitioning methods. So to do partitioning, um, you need a data matrix, uh, which is the input. <clears throat> you need a distance function, and you need to specify the number of groups that you want to partition the data into ahead of time. Okay, and the output is essentially a group assignment of of every object. Okay, so you're going to take each object and assign it to a group. So here's the algorithm. Um, just that's not showing up very well. <laughs> um, but essentially, what you do is you initialize um, the group center. So let, let's just talk about um, uh, uh, k-metoids k for for example. So you initialize the group centers, and it's also called a centroid or a metoid. And then you assign each object to the nearest centroid according to the distance metric. Okay, um, that makes sense. So you have you you take in, you pick a point in space and you say um, this is my centroid, and I have it. I have other centroids as well, and I'm going to take the distance from each of my objects to each of the centroids, and I'm going to assign it to the closest one. And then once you've made that assignment. Um, you can take, you can recompute the centroids by by um, taking each group independently and, and computing the centroid. So that might involve recalculating the, the mean of, of the centroid, um, or it may involve picking a new um, a new actual data point as a centroid. And then essentially what we do is repeat these last two steps until the assignment of the each of the objects stabilizes. So here's a here's an output of uh, of again our, our breast cancer data. And um, so what you can see is that there's kind of a well-separated group here. That's, okay. And there's another group over here. And there's another group over here. Um, and then you get this kind of two groups that overlap. And they're really kind of ambiguous there. So um, it's really hard to, to determine you know, which, wh wh whether the x's and these pluses, um, which group might be, um, it, it might be better assigned to. So um, it, one can make the argument, so I used five groups here um, 
and one can make the argument that maybe four groups would be better here. Um, so it just gives you a, a flavor for um, for what this does. And and, uh, and in fact, you're going to plot. You're going to do this yourself. So let me just. Um, I think it's worth. Hopefully, everyone can see the board here. Yeah, so, so this is all unsupervised so far, and we'll get to supervised in a minute. <coughs> okay, so let's say that we have two groups of data like that, <coughs> and we initialize centroids. Let's say we initialize uh, somewhere over here and somewhere over here. Okay. So um, well, let's make it. Okay. So essentially, what you do is you just calculate the distance um, between each point and its and a centroid, and you pick the one that is is closest to it. So um, so this one, you know, obviously be assigned here. Um, this one would be assigned here. Um, this one uh, may actually be assigned here. Uh, this one would be assigned here. Um, this one's quite ambiguous. You don't really know. But they're, they're, because you've calculated the distance precisely, um, you have to choose one. So let's just choose that. And then the rest would get assigned like this. Okay. So then what would happen uh, is we then have to recalculate the centroids. So let's do that. So now the centroids, uh, so these three guys were assigned to that one. And then this one, the centroid would probably be somewhere around here. And, uh, and you can quickly see that um, just in a few steps, um, you would converge and then it would stabilize. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of schematically how it works, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm going to get to that. So initialization is actually a key, key part of this. And uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, what is typical initializing data? Yeah. 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 So, so, sure. Um, so, so I think the distance metric is a nice way to. So, taking the distance matrix is a nice way to visualize the data. So, it doesn't matter you have, how many dimensions you have, you can always plot a distance matrix. In higher dimensional data set, yeah, it's it's difficult to visualize. Yeah. So. Um, so let's just look at what the difference between k-means and k-metoids. So in k-means, the centroids are actually the mean of the clusters. So I actually showed here, I showed the mean of the clusters. Um, and uh, in k-metoids, the centroids are actually a, a data object itself. So one might pick um, this as a centroid and maybe this one as a centroid. Okay. Uh, and, and that's that's the actual centroid. So the advantage of uh, of doing that is that uh, you just compute the distance uh, metrics between each of the objects, and you only compute that once, and then you can just look it up every time. You only have to compute that once. And here, uh, the centroids need to be recomputed at every iteration. Um, so here, uh, initialization could be difficult as um, again, the notion of a centroid might be really unclear before you start. So, so in a high dimensional data set, I mean, how do you, how do you kind of define what a centroid is in, in that sense? And, and uh, with k-metoids, actually, uh, you just pick a case. You pick a sample or you pick a gene, and that's your centroid. Um, and so it be, that becomes much more interpretable. Um, and in, in R, the command for running k-means is just k-means. And then uh, for k-metoids, it's, it's, it's PAM, which is partitioning around metoids. And again, we're going to look at PAM in the lab, so you'll get a, a much better feel of, of, of how that works. So let's look at, uh, in general, what the advantages and disadvantages of, of partitioning-based methods. So the advantage is that the, um, the number of groups is actually well-defined. So there's no ambiguity. With a hierarchical clustering, 
as you'll see, you have to kind of um, post-process the data and say, okay, I'm going to cut a dendrogram at this point, and that'll give me so many, so many number of groups. Um, well, the problem is uh, you'll always get this, this number of groups. And, and as I showed in that plot, um, that may not always be appropriate. And so um, there are methods to, uh, to actually intelligently choose a number of groups um, that can be applied to solve this problem. Um, so, so again, so the, the disadvantage of this is that you have to a priori choose a number of groups. Um, with partitioning-based methods, you really get a clear and deterministic assignment of an object to a group. Um, it, the, that's, that's, that's a nice advantage if the data is clean and it's well separated, um, but sometimes an object does not fit well into any cluster. So, so for example, you know, these two objects might be um, somewhat ambiguous, and uh, so, so that's a, that can be a problem. Um, as I showed, that the algorithms for inference are really quite simple. Um, the disadvantage of that is that um, often these are very sensitive to initialization. And so, um, so for example, if I initialized um, here and here, uh, I would do well. But if I initialized here and here, I may not do so well. And, um, and so often what we do is, is um, do multiple restarts um, and just choose the one that ends up separating the clusters the best. Okay, so let's talk about uh, agglomerative hierarchical clustering. Everyone's sort of seen these types of heat maps before. Um, what we get as an input, we have this, this matrix, this data matrix, uh, and then essentially what we do is reorder the, reorder the rows and reorder the columns of this matrix according to um, a, a distance metric. So what you need to input is, a, is essentially a distance matrix um, and uh, what's what we call a linkage method. And I'm going to describe some linkage methods. And the output is a tree called a dendrogram that defines the relationships between objects and the distance uh, between the clusters. And essentially what this represents is a nested sequence of clusters. So you start out at, at the leaves of the tree and build it up until you get the full tree. So let's just think about um, linkage methods for a minute. So what a linkage does is it actually pulls two clusters together. Um, and the way in which you do that uh, uh, also uh, sort of affects the results. So let's, let's talk about the different types of linkage methods that you may encounter. So let's say we have two groups delineated by the green circles and the blue squares. So single linkage takes the minimum pairwise distance uh, between uh, the, the, uh, any two objects in the green versus the blue. So you take all the pairs and compute the distance. Compute the distances. The one that's smallest is, is what's used for single linkage. Um, complete linkage takes the one that's the biggest. OK? Make sense? OK, and then we have um, distance between centroids. So here's a centroid of the green group, and here's a centroid of the blue group. And you just take that, um, take that as the distance. And then you have average linkage, which takes all the pairwise distances and, um, and takes the average. Two clusters, yeah. It's a, so it's a method to actually join two clusters, yeah. OK. Uh, and then another uh, very nice method of linkage is called uh, Ward, and um, this is this basically forms partitions that um, minimizes what we call the loss associated with each grouping. So you can imagine if you group two um, two groups together erroneously, you can have some loss function that describes the error involved in doing that. Um, and this error is described uh, is defined as the error sum of squares. And so let's just consider 10 objects, OK? And they have scores. Uh, they have these scores here. And, uh, and so you take the, within each group, you take the mean of the group, and then you calculate the distance to the mean and square that, OK? So, so for this group of 10, the mean is 2.5. And uh, so then we, the error sum of squared is just um, each value minus that mean squared and summed over all the all the objects, so you get this number. 
if you had a perfect grouping of this, you would group, group the zeros together, you group the twos together, you group the sixes together, and you group the five together. So, um, so then you have a sum of uh, four different groups. Uh, but within each group, um, the mean is zero here, and so then they're all zero, and so, so the overall error sum of squared is zero. Here the mean would be two, and again the error sum of squared would be zero, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the um, error sum of squared total is just the error sum of squared um, for all the groups. And so if you get the correct assignment, you have a, a zero error. And so by using, uh, uh, so for, for this, the, the ten, 10 scores into four clusters, um, that, that, that's a perfect clustering and you get a zero value. And so we'll look at how, what the difference between um, the different link, linkage methods, methods right now. Um, okay, so I hope this didn't print this way in the slides, but this should be an open double quote. This is just a double quote here. I just noticed this now. But um, let's look at linkage methods in action. Okay, so the clustering based on single linkage, and what I've done here is cluster the samples in our breast cancer data set um, using single linkage. Okay, um, and and you guys again are going to do this um, exercise. So if you use single single linkage, um, what tends to happen is you get these long chains of clusters. Okay, you get these long chains, and and this can really be um, quite difficult to interpret. So I mean how how would you actually interpret this? Can somebody have ideas of, like, how would you visually kind of subgroup this um, if you were to just, you know, there might be a, a group here, um, there may be a group over here, but the rest just look like linear chains. Th this one is actually really quite difficult to interpret. Um, and here's, again, this is identical data. Um, identical distance metric. The only thing I've changed is the linkage method. So if you move from single linkage to complete linkage, um, which remember is the maximum distance between any two pairs, um, you get something that looks like this. And this is starting to look a lot more interpretable. One can imagine um, maybe cutting the dendrogram here and saying that, um, or maybe even here, and saying that there's a group here would be a group here, um, one here, one here, one here, one here. Um, and so th this becomes um, a lot more pleasant, I think, to deal with. Um, here's the centroid linkage. Um, this has a problem that um, actually it's not monotonically increasing, and so you get these kind of really weird type of um, uh, clusters. And, um, and, and then what th the reason is is that um, which I'll get to a, a little bit later, is that once you actually cluster, um, you can't go backwards and undo that clustering. And so, um, so, so th th this, th that's the nature of hierarchical clustering, and, and I'll just talk about that in a minute. So, and then this is average linkage. So again, this has um, some fairly nice properties uh, that one, one could use. So you could imagine a cluster here, one here, one here, one here, and then some, some individuals here. And then this is ward clustering. So um, this is arguably maybe maybe the most interpretable because you can just slice the dendrogram across here and you get one, two, three, four, five, six groups. Um, so again, the moral of the story here is that um, the method of linkage that you choose uh, really affects the results. And um, so, again, it's um, it becomes in some ways a lot of a lot of this becomes subjective um, in terms of you should know your data, know what you're expecting, what you, you might expect to see, um, and and choose something that um, that makes sense in the output. But just be aware that there are other other um, linkage methods that uh, that may give a cleaner or more interpretable or um, it's hard to say more correct because we're doing discovery and we don't know what we're trying to find. But, um, but, but just be aware that these different linkage methods make a difference. Yeah. Any questions so far? Can you show one of the, one of the pictures that uh, supports the partial interpret? So, so does it basically mean the 
That should be too linear. Okay, be too linear. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So each, yeah, so the branching, um, there, there are too many branches. Yeah, yeah. OK, so let's just have a look at hierarchical clustering then. So um, the advantages of this is that there actually may be small clusters nested inside large ones. Okay, And so um, sometimes what we can do is just pick out the really nice, tight, small clusters um, as, as, being, uh, as being sort of important, functionally important. Um, the disadvantage is that um, clusters might not be naturally represented by a hierarchical structure. So um, the notion of, um, of pairwise uh, clustering may, once you, again, once you group um, a case uh, in, in a cluster, it can't be undone uh, later on. And so, um, so this, is a, this can be a bit problematic. Um, one of the advantages is that, in, in contrast to Partitioning methods is that there's no need to specify the number of groups ahead of time. Um, but as I showed, um, we have to actually uh, cut the dendrogram in order to produce clusters. And where to cut um, is often arbitrary. Uh, and so um, you can just sort of look at the plot and say, OK, well, I think there are these groups here, and, and that's, what I'm gonna, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to do. So, um, so some, sometimes this can be subjective and arbitrary. Um, Advantages are that uh, actually you can use a number of different linkage methods. I mean, I think this is actually a bit of a strength. Um, uh, however, um, as we saw with the uh, centroids, is that bottom-up clustering um, can result in poor structure at the top of the tree. Uh, and that's really because the early joins um, can't be undone. So this is what we call a, a, a greedy algorithm. Um, and, uh, and, and it converges in a similar way that um, that uh, partitioning methods would converge to local local clustering, local optima, and often doesn't find a globally optimal solution. Yeah. This, this is a vertical lines in those graphs have any meaning? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the um, the vertical lines represent the distance between um, these clusters, uh, and uh, uh, and so so for example. Um, uh, according to linkage, okay, so that's the calculation. Yeah. So, so these these two groups are really quite distant distant from each other because they've got these long vertical lines, okay. Okay. So now we're just going to briefly discuss uh, model based approaches to clustering. Um, we're going to assume that the data are generated generated from a mixture of, uh, of, let's say, k distributions. And the task is to uh, infer a cluster assignment and parameters of these distributions that best explain the data. Um, another way to say this is that we're going to actually fit a model to the data, uh, and we try to get the best fit of that model um, that explains the data in the most parsimon parsimonious way. And a classical example is, is a mixture of Gaussians or a mixture of normals. Uh, for, for continuous data, and I'll, I'll, I'll show an example of that in a minute. Um, the advantage of this is that you can take advantage of um, really well-established probability theory and well-defined distributions and statistics um, and, and can sort of um, mathematically represent data uh, in a principled way. So um, here's an example, just returning to this array CGH example. Um, so here you really have um, three types of states, if you will, in the, in, in the chromosome. You have neutral, which are kind of these, these points that are centered around 0. Um, and you have losses, which are these red squares in this context. And you have gains, which are these green squares in this context. And what you can see is actually the data is a bit noisy. And so you have these kind of singular probes that um, um, are are classified as neutral by what is by an expert by looking at it visually, and um, uh, but so if you could imagine maybe just drawing a threshold. Say I'm going to draw a threshold and say anything below zero I'm going to call a loss, or anything maybe below let's say minus 0.1 I'm going to call a loss. Anything above plus 0.1 I'm going to call a gain, um, and everything else I'm going to call a neutral. 
But then if you did that, then you'd classify all these single outlier points um, as, as being aberrant when, in fact, they're neutral. So what we can do is take advantage of, of probability distributions that can model this noise. And so if you see, if you, if you consider a distribution like this red curve here that may have generated this data, and a different distribution that may have generated the blue data, and a third distribution that generated this green data, um, we, can, uh, we can have a, a sort of principled um, quantitative metric of, of how likely each data point is, is to have been generated from each of these distributions. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so yeah, you, that's the disadvantage of these approaches, that you have to specify the, um, the number of groups or the number of, uh, of distributions. And um, there, are, there are principled methods to do that, um, the Bayesian information criterion and, um, and uh, others like it. Yeah, so you could do it that way, and then you, evalu you can evaluate, again, in a mathematically principled way, um, which model best fits the data uh, yeah, using model selection. So that's a bit advanced, but um, yeah. So here's just a, a, an example, and, and um, I'm going to show you uh, a, a model-based approach to um, clustering array CGH data um, that, that really kind of um, illustrates all these concepts. So let's say you have a, a number of, um, just, just ignore this model on the left, because I think it'll be confusing, but it just to look at the part on the right. So let's say we have a set of array CJ samples, and uh, we want to cluster them uh, into, into a set of groups. So one thing we could do is if there are recurrent alterations um, in one group versus a different group, is we can try to um, detect those. And then we can infer what we call a, a profile uh, that represents a group. And it might look like this, where this represents um, the probability in that group that you'd find a gain. And the green curve is the probability in that group that you'd find a loss. Um, and then we can um, do what we call feature selection, which is to say, okay, well, which, um, which one of these, uh, which of these features is most discriminative between the two groups? And so we can end up with what we call s these sparse profiles that say, actually, um, this becomes then a model for this group. So this group should have um, be characterized by, uh, by gains in this region and losses in these two regions. And this group um, should be characterized by gains in this region and losses in these two regions. And, and so what we get uh, out of, the, of a model-based approach is, in addition to the clustering itself, which is assignment of a, each object to a group, we get a model that actually tells us what the group looks like. And that's um, what we don't get from, for example, hierarchical clustering or partitioning-based methods. So um, similar to. Similar to this, um, we're actually going to infer the shape of these distributions, and we can see that well, the losses um, have a distribution that looks like this, the gains have a distribution that looks like this, and the and, a, and the um, and the neutrals have a distribution that looks like this. Um, and so, so you really get um, what we call a model uh, for each group out of it. And the the nice thing that you get out of that is that. Um, you essentially get a classifier for free. So then when you have a new patient, um, then you can compare the new patient to each of the models that you've um, derived using model-based clustering and see which one it most it fits best. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So, and then again, um, choosing the number of groups, which has already been brought up, becomes a model selection problem. Um, and you can look at uh, the Bayesian information criterion, and I point, it, point you to a reference here um, that talks about model, model selection in, in bioinformatics. Okay, so here's just an applied example uh, from some of my own work. And, uh, and, and this is taking that array CGH um, clustering method and applying it to a cohort of 106 um, follicular lymphoma patients. And, um, and so the moral of the story is that, um, again, it's one of these heat maps where the, each patient is a row, and each, uh, each column represents uh, a probe in the array, or, or a feature uh, in the array. And, uh, and so the data gets nicely separated into these groups. This one's characterized by gains of, of chromosome 7. This one by gains of chromosome 18. 
this gains by this is characterized by gains of 1p, um, and then we have a group that um, has gains of uh, 6q and a loss, uh, sorry, 6p and a loss of 6q. And then there's one group in the middle that's kind of sparse and doesn't have much going on in it at all. And so, um, so we clustered the data, and then uh, we had clinical endpoints, which were um, time to transformation of follicular lymphoma to a more aggressive type of lymphoma called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And um, and then so we plotted the survival curves of that, and and indeed, so this is this is kind of taking the whole. Um, you take the data, you cluster it, and then you look at association with outcome. And we had a, a nice association with outcome here uh, for these cases um, that had this uh, the, the, uh, aberration in six, chromosome six and seven had uh, a much quicker um, time to transformation to DLBCL than did the other groups. Um, again, this this is suggestive, um, but it's a, you know it's a relatively small cohort. But at least it suggested that there is some association. And, and without clustering the data, we may not have seen this in the first place. So now just to illustrate, so what this plot up here, so this is the heat map of the data. And what this plot up here is, is that it shows the actual profiles, the sparse profiles. So again, um, you get a representation of each group. And you can imagine um, uh, uh, taking a new patient and comparing it to this profile versus this profile, this profile, this profile, and this profile, and seeing which one it most closely matches, and maybe make some predictions as to uh, uh, with, with regard to prognosis of transformation. OK, so let's just uh, spend a minute talking about feature selection. So the advantage of sparse profiles, which I mentioned earlier, is that um, in fact, most features, whether they're genes or SNP probe sets or bat clones uh, in high dimensional data sets, will actually be uninformative. Um, so you have some genes, for example, in gene expression are unexpressed. So they're just not expressed at all. You have others that are expressed ubiquitously and, and are always kind of up, uh, highly expressed no matter what, uh, uh, so-called housekeeping genes. Or you have um, what we sometimes call in cancer, we call passenger alterations, which are just kind of results of genomic instability that don't actually um, uh, confer any, any, any tumor genesis. And they're often kind of considered biological noise in the data. And we want to try to avoid those. We want to try to ignore those when we're actually trying to extract structure from data. So uh, the message here is that clustering and, and also classification has a much higher chance of success if these uninformative features are removed first. Um, and so let's just discuss some simple approaches. So one can measure the variability of genes or expression across all the samples and pick intrinsically variable ones. So genes that are, um, genes that are, are uniform across the samples, of course, won't give you any information as to how to separate those samples. The ones that are variable will. And so, so you can take um, different uh, measures of variance, such as interquartile range, uh, entropy, uh, and, and actually with just a standard deviation as a way of measuring um, intrinsically variable genes. Um, so the other thing is that you can uh, require uh, a minimum level of expression uh, in a proportion of samples. So, um, so, so in, order for, uh, in order for you to choose a gene, you have to have it at least expressed at some level in, uh, in, in this proportion of samples. This is called K over A or P over A uh, analysis, and we'll do We'll do this uh, in the lab using the gene filter package. Okay. So, um, so those are just some um, some tricks and uh, and actually, I mean, important steps to to, to carry out when doing uh, feature selection and uh, and clustering. Okay. So, clustering certainly doesn't end there, and I've just really given you a very brief overview of, of, of clustering. Uh, we have uh, uh, a much more advanced topics in clustering are instead of bottom-up clustering um, that are showed in hierarchical clustering, um, there, there are methods for top-down clustering. Um, one can do a bi-clustering um, or two-way clustering, so cluster on the genes and samples simultaneously. Um, what we're doing is we're doing genes and samples sequentially, but um, one can do it uh, at the same time. Uh, principal components analysis, um, again, the, 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 the idea of choosing a number of groups 
um, and model selection. Um, so there are, there are different methods here. Um, the the uh, Akaki information criteria and the, the uh, Bayesian information criteria, the silhouette coefficient and, and the gap curve are some terms you might see. And uh, again, I'll point you to some references that um, I have not yet compiled, but I promise I will, uh, where you can look up these terms. Um, and I'll point you to a couple of textbooks, in fact, that this is all textbook stuff. So. Um, and then finally, uh, a topic of, uh, uh, of great interest, actually, um, to me as a, uh, as a, as a computer scientist and, and a probabilist is, is actually doing clustering and feature selection uh, simultaneously. So, so actually the, the model I showed, um, it adapts as, as, it, um, as it converges. And so it might change the features that are important based on the clustering. And then, um, and then that, that choice of features might change the clustering. And the clustering, again, might inform the, the choice of, 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 of uh, feature selection. So uh, it's adaptive as it, um, and it considers both things um, simultaneously. Whereas most methods um, and, uh, really do this, this step first and then do the clustering. And it might be, that might be information loss. So that's, that's just uh, something to consider. OK, so just a review of clustering. Um, Three main approaches, hierarchical, partitioning, and model-based. Um, it's Feature selection is, is very important. Um, there are two, two reasons for that. Is that um, well, actually, I didn't discuss this before, but um, feature selection actually reduces computational time as well. Um, so that's actually quite important, um, especially when you're trying to do um, often distance metrics. Um, well, distance metrics are almost invariably uh, an n squared operation, which means that you have to um, look at every pair of, uh, of objects in your data set. So if you've got 22,000, um, that gets into the billions of operations um, quite quickly. And so, uh, so if you can reduce that down to, let's say, 100 features, then you're talking about 1,000, uh, sorry, 10,000 operations, um, which is uh, orders, of course, orders of magnitude um, slower, uh, faster. <coughs> so um, Again, to reiterate, the distance metric matters. The linkage method matters in hierarchical clustering. And, um, and then model-based approaches, although they're much more advanced from a, a statistics point of view, um, they do offer principled probabilistic models where you can sort of unambiguously and mathematically describe um, what, what, what you've done. So um, let's see, what time are we at? So the break's at 3, is that right? Two forty. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, good. So we'll do uh, fifteen minutes, ten fifteen minutes on classification, then we'll take a break. Yeah. So these are all unsupervised coefficients. That's correct. So now we get into supervised. <laughs> yeah. So so. Um, I think people have done hybrids of model-based and hierarchical. It's kind of on the fringes of uh, of statistics, though. And so um, I believe I think there's one paper that I've come across that does it. Yeah. So it's um, it's not to say that it's not it's it's probably a good idea, but um, because then it's kind of trying to do the best of both have the best of both worlds. And um, uh, it, but the machinery needs to be invented to do it properly. Okay, so questions have come up about uh, unsupervised versus supervised. So this is supervised learning now, uh, cl classification, also called discriminant analysis. And so the big difference here is that we work from a set of objects with predefined classes. So recall that we were trying to discover classes using clustering. Here we're given the classes uh, along with the features. Um, and so, so one can think about um, maybe trying to uh, build a classifier that can distinguish between, let's say, basal and luminal, or let's say a good responder versus a poor responder. And um, the task is really to learn from the features of the objects what, what's really the basis for discrimination. Uh, and, uh, and then can I, can I apply that using, um, using to my new data for which I don't know the classes. 
So this, is, this classification is much more uh, statistically and mathematically heavy than clustering. So um, I thought to illustrate the points, I'd just do this by, uh, by, uh, by illustration. <coughs> and uh, this is just schematically here. Um, you could have, for example, uh, uh, patients that uh, have gene expression profiles that, that look some, something like this, and they have a poor response. Uh, and, uh, and then you might have patients that look like this and they have a good response. And so you want to learn a classifier that essentially provides a model for poor response and a model for good response. And so when you have a new patient, you just compare this to each of these two and say which one does it fit closely or give me some sort of probability that it belongs to this group versus this group. Um, and so uh, a, a very nice example of this from gene expression data um, is in a paper um, by George Wright et al., uh, who's, who's from Lou Stout's group, uh, working on uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, and this was published in PNAS in 2003. <clears throat> and essentially, what this group did is um, uh, built a classifier that can distinguish the cell of origin of DLBCL based on expression. Um, and the implications for that is that the cell of origin, uh, be it ABC or GCB, and um, I've forgotten what these stand for. Maybe some ger germinal center B cell and and what's the A? Any help from pathologists? No. It, okay, it doesn't matter. But um, it, it, we can abstract this to any any types actually. Um, so the the point of the matter is is that um, you can tell that there's quite a striking pattern. Um, that defines uh, these ABC uh, DLBCLs and, uh, and then these GCB uh, DLBCLs. And you can learn a classifier that gives you a quantitative output um, given a new case of, uh, of, of what, um, what class they would belong to given, given, given an expression profile. So all of these classes, uh, oh, sorry, all of these patients uh, uh, would have uh, near 100% probability of being ABC, um, and all of these patients would have almost a, uh, you know, almost close to a zero probability, and uh, and then vice versa for the GCB. So these guys, if you're, uh, so so these guys here, which are GCB, have um, have uh, a very high probability uh, here and a low probability of being ABC. So the pink curve is the probability of ABC, and then and the blue curve is the probability of GCB. Okay. So, of course, the, the, why this is important is that um, GCB and ABC have uh, differential outcomes. Okay, so um, this becomes a prognostic marker uh, as to the GCB subtype um, does much well, much better in terms of overall survival than does the ABC subtype. Okay, and this is just two different um, experiments that we did using different expression platforms. Um, to, uh, to, to come up with the same conclusion. So let's just talk about how they did this, because uh, it's a nice, simple, elegant, do you, do you find what it is? Uh, the activated B-cell. Activated B-cell. OK, so germinal center versus activated B-cell. Thank you. OK, <laughs> so we all learned something. Um, so uh, this is. Um, a, a, a model that takes uh, uh, a feature selection into account, um, not necessarily deterministically. So it, it doesn't just um, take a threshold and ignore genes. It weights the contribution of genes to the to the predictor, and that's that's just demonstrated here. So the weight um, of gene J is actually uh, this is determined by t test statistics. So given a labeling of the data, so we know that some cases are um, are A B C. In some cases, are GCB. Um, we can uh, then look at uh, a computed t-test statistic of the, uh, um, the distribution of expression between one group versus the other, and then use that as a weight in this uh, what's called a linear predictor score. Okay, so this is the weight, and then this is the expression level of that particular gene. Okay, um, and we can assume that um, there are really two dis two distinct distributions of these. Uh, and uh, one's for ABC and one's for GCB. So we can learn one of these for ABC and learn one of these for GCB. So it's very similar to those distributions that I, that I mentioned earlier. So, <clears throat> schematically, 
So one can imagine a distribution that this one could be GCB and this one could be ABC. And, uh, and then given some way of um, determining a density from a particular case, you can classify the cases um, according to those distributions. And so again, there's a principle of mathematical machinery. We can use Bayes' rule uh, to determine a probability that a sample comes from, let's say, group one. So uh, this is just a linear predictor score of, uh, of a given case. Um, and uh, given the parameters of the linear predictor score for, let's say, um, ABC, which would be indexed by one, so these are just parameters of the distribution. Uh, so you take this, um, this, this the, the, the density function of, of, of uh, the case for ABC, and then just put that over the sum of the two, and, uh, and you get a probability uh, that represents um, group one. So, so, so you get a, a density function that, um, in, in the end, gives you a posterior probability that your case is in group one. So, um, so this is all very nice, and um, but so they did do. Um, I mentioned that they use weighting, but they also did some deterministic feature selection. So they use a, a method called cross validation. So this is just kind of an important technique that um, uh, that I wanted to uh, discuss that um, deals with the problem of overfitting. So what we do is we pick a set of samples that we want to learn a classifier from, and we use all but one of the samples as a training set and we leave one out for testing. Okay. So we fit the model using the training data, and then we ask the question, can the classifier correctly pick the class of the remaining case? So we know the, what the class is, because this is training data, remember? And, and we, we can, so we can evaluate um, how, how well, and then we do this, repeat this exhaustively, leaving out each sample in turn. Um, and so, uh, so we can get a, an accurate uh, a way of measuring the accuracy of the, of the classifier. Um, and then what we do is we, we repeat using different sets and numbers of genes, um, again, based on this t-statistic. Um, so, so we can filter on t-statistic um, by taking the top 50, top, top 100, top 150, et cetera, uh, and then see basically which set of genes gives us the highest accuracy. Okay, so that's a, me that's a method that they use uh, for, to select their features. Um, and I think that the... Um, they ended up with something like uh, tens of features, so I think it's something like 40 that gave the most discriminative. So you really collapse the data set down from 22,000 features uh, to 40 uh, that give you a, a reasonable classification. Okay. So just some words on overfitting. Uh, in many cases in biology, um, again, the number of features is much larger than the number of samples. Um, and so it, at the end of the day, uh, important features just may not be represented in the training data, and, and this can result in overfitting. So, um, so overfitting happens when a classifier discriminates well on its training data, uh, but does not generalize well to external cohorts or orthogonally derived data sets. And so, um, it, in, when you're building a classifier, uh, validation is required in at least one external cohort to believe the results. Um, and, uh, and, and so these expression subtypes, the reason why they've sort of become dogma uh, in, the, in the breast cancer world is that actually they have been um, validated uh, uh, in numerous data sets and on different platforms, uh, et cetera. So uh, some advanced topics again is that, um, so one can use Bayesian priors to regularize parameter estimates of the model. So I can talk more about that offline if um, people want to talk about that. Um, and again, some methods now integrate uh, feature selection and, classify, and classification in unified analytical framework. So, so in the same way that I did that for the ERACI CGH problem, people have done that for um, classification in gene expression. So there's a really nice um, piece of work here uh, by Alexander Hardemink um, at Duke. And, um, and, and so there's, there's actually software that you can just import your gene expression um, data, your label gene expression data into um, and it'll simultaneously classify and uh, do the feature selection. So at the end of the day, you don't not only get a classifier, but you get the most discriminative um, set of genes. And that can tell you something about biology as well. Um, 
So uh, again, cross-validation should always be used in training the classifier. So just some ways of evaluating a classifier. Um, so this is just an example of a receiver operator characteristic curve, or called a rock curve, ROC. Um, and essentially what it does is it plots the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And so uh, I'll just go through how that's calculated. So given ground truth, so you need a, a ground truth data set that you know the classes and some sort of probabilistic classifier similar to the one I showed. Um, you can't do this with deterministic classifiers that say it's this or that. You need a classifier that says it's this with some probability. And the reason is because you can then set some number of probability thresholds and compute the true positive rate, which is the proportion of positives that were tr the proportion of positives in the ground truth set that were predicted as such. And you can compute the false positive rate, which is just the number of false predictions um, taken over the total number of predictions. And so you do this for each, uh, some number of probability thresholds, and you can plot a curve that, like, that looks like this. And basically, the closer this curve is to the top left corner, the more accurate your classifier. Okay. So if you get something along the diagonal here, that's essentially as good as random. So that's, that's not good. So some other methods for classification that you may see in the literature um, support vector machines, uh, linear discriminant analysis, logistic regression, random forest. All these I thought were probably um, uh, a little bit too, um, too heavy duty for, uh, for, for this audience. And, uh, but if you are interested, um, I would recommend just looking at these two review papers um, that, that go over these topics and, and will point you to the actual um, development of the methods uh, that are involved in that. So um, I think it's a reasonable time to take some questions, and uh, then we can take a break. So any questions? Ah, so, um, so false discovery rate is usually set by the user, uh, and it's it's um, you take the um, you have a tolerance for. Okay, so what you can do is you can say um, I have a tolerance of uh, let's say one percent false discovery rate, and, and it's based on this type of analysis, and so what this tells you is that. Um, this, this lets you um, use the probability threshold that gives you that false discovery, that false positive rate, uh, and that's the false, then, then that determines the false discovery rate. So you apply that threshold to any any new cases that you see. Yeah. Okay.